When I see all the refugees arriving in Germany today, it reminds me of when we fled from Poland to the West, when I was a child. I did nothing wrong. Our children didn't support the regime. Or the revolution. We lived in the heart of Damascus. Our house was destroyed. There were so many massacres. I lived in constant fear. You lost track of who was killing whom. You lose sight of the truth. When the train arrived at the Friedland transit camp in 1947, it marked the beginning of a new life. That's why Friedland is almost like a birthplace to me. When I meet children in Friedland today, whether they come from Syria or Lebanon or wherever, I see myself in them. Then I have to ask myself if these little girls, these little six or seven year olds, will ever get the chance as I was given. Once you've been uprooted, is it possible to put down new roots? What can we, the ones who managed it, do for these people so that they succeed too? I come from Russia. I grew up in a German-speaking village. We spoke a German dialect at home. It was a small German community. And my parents always dreamt about moving to Germany one day. But it wasn't something that I ever really thought about. I was happy and content in Russia. But in 1991, my parents decided to move here. Majid is nicht da. Wo ist die Musik? Alle Kinder platschen. Platschen. Hallo, hallo. Schön, dass du da bist. Hallo, hallo. Schön, dass du da bist. Die 
The children only stay with us for five days. That's not very long. But even in those five days, we can see how much they change. Parents have shown us drawings their children made of masked men with weapons, and they told us how much that upset them. One family said they still never get undressed because they think it's still like in Syria and they could be bombed at any minute. But slowly they start to live normal lives again. And at some point the children start to draw happier pictures with flowers or something cheerful. Not so shocking. Gelb. 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 Oh. No, la. Gelb. Gelb. Ja, yeah. bravo. In 1991, I thought I would never come back to Friedland. Those seven days were such a shock to my system. I don't think I understood anything that was going on. I always had a headache. I had to figure things out and couldn't really grasp how different everything was here. To begin with, even though I could speak German, I couldn't understand anyone. I think that happens, that you don't understand anything anymore. It's so unfamiliar, like losing your way in a forest. You're completely disoriented. When I see people arriving here, I have a sense that they also have headaches, just like I did. I know how they feel. They feel the way I did back then. I'm so restless. I can't sleep. I just want to find somewhere quiet to be with my children. I can't ever go back to Afghanistan. I left my first husband without getting divorced. In Afghanistan, the punishment for that is stoning. I was forced to marry when I was 15. There was a huge age difference, 35 years. That's why I left. Later, I met my second husband. He's the father of my children. I married him in secret. That's why we fled to Europe. I lived in Norway for three years. One night the police came to our door. It was three or four in the morning. We were asleep. It was a shock, especially for me and my eldest daughter. The police told us we had ten minutes to get ready to leave. Until the minute that they came and took us, we couldn't really believe what was happening. When we were sitting in the plane back to Afghanistan, I fell apart. My first husband is very powerful. He would have been able to find me anywhere in Afghanistan. I was in a terrible state. I was convinced that my life and the lives of my family were in danger. We were afraid to leave the house. I could have been spotted by relatives of my first husband. I fled Afghanistan again with my second husband. He's still in Turkey. My children and I were given a very warm welcome here. My strength is returning. I feel optimistic. I hope we'll be able to stay.
That was 69 years ago. We were in those corrugated steel huts over there. I remember how we would sit on the beds. It was all such a novel experience. But we all sat on those bunk beds together. It's very moving to see it all again. But times have changed. This became my area of expertise. I was a university professor. Friedland has a very good reputation as a refugee camp, which is partly thanks to people like you. I love the term transit camp. It spells out that life for refugees is about moving on. A transit camp should be a place of security amid the chaos of fleeing, the drama of what you've experienced. That was certainly how I felt. It's a space, a buffer zone, where you can gather your thoughts and think about where you want to go, where you're allowed to go. It's a place where someone gives you something to eat, a bed to sleep in, a roof over your head, helps you sort out your papers and everything you need in order to move on. My name, My name is Johanna Heil. I'm a Caritas counsellor. I'm sure you all have lots of questions about your children who are still in Lebanon. It's about my daughter. She's married and lives in Jordan. She spent two days waiting on the border to get back in. Two days? We want her to come here. She wasn't allowed to re-enter the country. She had to go back to Damascus. She wanted to say goodbye to us all before we left. She came on her own. An officer promised her she'd be able to enter the country again in a week's time. Her daughter flew from Jordan to Lebanon to say goodbye, and now they won't let her back in. I can understand that you're very worried about your daughter. You don't know what's going on, and you're concerned that she's on her own in a complicated situation. She says it might be her fault. She just wanted to say goodbye, and now her daughter can't go home. I just want my family to be together and lead a normal life. That's all I want. A place where we can be safe. Somewhere to live. I want our children to get an education. We want them to go to school. Thank God I'm still strong enough to work. I hope our children have an opportunity to go to school. They've lost so many years. I hope that my eldest son can come here with his wife. He was less fortunate than we were. I hope he can get here. When my wife thinks of our eldest son, she cries all night. I hope we can get help in bringing him here. He wasn't one of the lucky ones. We only just arrived in Germany. So far, everything we've seen has been wonderful. We were given a very kind, warm welcome. Everyone says good morning to us. Everyone smiles at us. No one looks as though they resent us. People smiling at us makes us feel welcome.
Also die Menschen, die hier in Friedland ankommen. The people who arrive in Friedland have fled conflicts. It's shocking to see the faces of refugees coming from places like Eritrea. Young people, young men, young women traveling alone. They have long journeys behind them. They've made their way here across the African continent and across the Mediterranean from northern Africa. The trip is dangerous and they're probably tied up with shady people smugglers who they are forced to rely on in their bid to apply for asylum in Germany. You can't make an application from outside Europe. You have to enter Europe illegally. There's no way to apply for asylum from outside Europe. Where did you stay in Libya when you were traveling on your own? I stayed at a farm in Abu Zalim where a lot of other people from Eritrea and Somalia were living, people from Nigeria and Ghana too. One day I got a job. A man showed up and told me I could clean his mother's house for 50 dinar a day. I went with him. We drove a long way and at some point I didn't know where we were anymore. We were no longer on the main road. We stopped. There were only two black men there. No mother. The man who'd driven me there was white, so there were three men. They told me to take off my clothes. I told them I was there to work, that I didn't need to take off my clothes to work. Then one of them hit me. I cried, but no one could hear me. One of the dark-skinned men kept hitting me. He beat me senseless. I took my headscarf to cover myself up. They said to me, don't act as though you were a woman. You're nothing. Your death would mean nothing. Then they took my headscarf and used it to tie my hands together. I couldn't feel anything anymore. Were you unconscious? Yes. They blindfolded me. I was powerless. There were three of them. I lost track of time. I don't know if I regained consciousness that day or the next. Then they took me to another farm with African refugees. It wasn't the same one I'd been at before. They left me lying outside it. I don't know how long I was there. Then people found me. They put me in a room, but no one dared touch me. For months I didn't know what was going on around me. Later I realized I was pregnant. All the refugees there wanted to get away, to Europe. I gave all my savings to people smugglers. They took us to Italy. Then I paid more smugglers to take me to Germany. The other refugees knew that I didn't have any money left. But they helped me. They collected money for me. There are still good people in the world. There was a lot of good. When I was in such a bad state, I just wanted to die. I could only think about the problems. But then I began to hope things would get better. Nothing will happen to you here in Germany. You're safe. No one can hurt you. I will raise this child. It was a traumatic experience, but it's not the child's fault. Will you be able to love the child? I hope so.
Wie geht's Ihnen heute? Wie geht's Ihnen? Ups. Wie geht's Ihnen? Wie geht's Ihnen? Danke. Ja? Nein. Frage, noch einmal. Stellen Sie die Frage. Was sind Sie geboren? Wien am 15. 15. Oder? 15. Ja. Juni. 95. Geboren. 95 geboren. Sehr gut. 95 geboren. Klasse. Super. Wo wohnen Sie? Ich wohne in Kiel. Gut. Mhm. An Alla? Okay, okay, ja, gut. Noch einmal, bitte. I always thought Germany was a beautiful country. I love to watch German football. I'm crazy about it. I always want Germany to win. Go Germany! The goalkeeper pulls a face like a tiger when he dives for the ball. Just like a tiger. I really like Germany. I never dared dream I'd come here one day. The dogs in Syria, they bite. <laughs> They're not pets and honestly not very nice. No, they're not nice. And they're dirty. I'm afraid of them. Here we've seen dogs with special hairdos. People here bathe their dogs and take them to the doctor. We don't do that. But this is a lovely country. The people are nice. We had fun on today's outing.
Friedland is a very peaceful place. I've been here 22 days and have been very happy. I just got my transfer papers. I'm being moved tomorrow. I'm a bit worried about what will happen next. I hope I'll be granted asylum here. When I talk to the other refugees here in Friedland about how they were persecuted and the difficulties they've had, then I feel that my own problems are relatively minor in comparison. Everyone has a story to tell. Every story is full of suffering and sorrow. I am now going to tell you the places you're being sent. I wasn't the one who chose them. They were decided by representatives in the states where you'll be going. Let's start with Jibreel. You're going to Wiesau. Let me show you where it is on the map. It's east of Bayreuth. Bayreuth is the nearest big city. You'll be leaving tomorrow at 8 in the morning. All the other families are being sent to a town called Breitenbrunn in Saxony. It's south of the city of Chemnitz. Abdel Al-Aziz Al-Husari. Kanaz Al-Habal. Mustafa Mainazi. Good. Hello, Mariana. How are you? You leave Fulta tomorrow and you'll go to Oldenburg. Yes, I think tomorrow learn. you'll go have a breakfast and then yes. the bus will come and you'll say bye bye Friedland. <laughs> <laughs> no, I come again, Friedland. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> Wunderbar. All the best for you. Thanks a lot. <laughs> We've heard that some people in Saxony don't like Arabs and that we'd be better off someplace else. But a friend of mine told me that Saxony is lovely and that I shouldn't listen to the others. He's been here for 27 years. And he says, believe me, Germans are the same all over the country. They all treat you the same. Don't be put off, he said. People say all sorts of things. Maybe people in Saxony are the nicest. We hope so. They're no different from people here. I'm sure they're the same. In a talk yesterday, we heard that Article 1 of German Basic Law says that human dignity is inviolable. That's why I can't believe that if it says that in the Constitution, that people will treat others badly. I can't imagine that. It was good to hear. People come before all else. Danke 
Danke für jedes gute Wort. Danke, dass deine Hand mich leiten will an jedem Ort. Dear sisters and brothers, Many of you are looking forward to tomorrow. You've learned that you'll be transferred to Saxony, Baden-Württemberg, Bavaria. You're probably wondering what awaits you there. Where will you live? Where will your children go to school? Will you get a job? Will you learn the language? And you'll meet people who will show you the same kindness that you've experienced in Friedland. But you might also meet people who are less kind. There are people in Germany who are afraid of foreigners, who stir up anger against you and your friends. It will be an exciting time for you. You're heading into the future, but looking back at the past, because, of course, your hearts and minds are still in your homelands and with the people who can't be here beside you. What I wish for you is that you can follow your path in peace and safety. It's been known to happen that people leave Friedland at 8 in the morning, but then call us at 5 in the afternoon from Schleswig-Holstein or Saxony, saying, please come and get us, because the accommodation they've been given is inhumane. That does happen. The way it's done in Saxony is that everyone is housed together in one place, in holiday homes or guest houses. With kitchens? Of course. They're all self-contained units. Many have told us that they have family members coming on the next flights, and we've passed that on. I know that family is very important in your cultures and that naturally you want to be together, and we can always strive for this in the long term. So no need to worry yet. It's never rained like this before. Someone must be very sad that you're all going. We're crying too, for our people, our homes. You're all really good friends, even though you've only just got to know each other. But here you do bond somehow. You're not alone. Look, everyone's going with you. I hope I'll see my children again, that they can join me. I hope you get everything you wish for, too. I hope things go well for you. Let's hope.
لاند فريد لاند حبيبي وتميل تعطفها وتنسى رمش عينيك حبيبة <laughs> We're making fun of poor Amer. He hasn't slept since yesterday. When we arrived in Friedland, he fell in love with her straight away. He said to me, look at that girl. I told him, she is beautiful, but she is Christian. But he only had eyes for her. <laughs> He fell in love with her, and she fell in love with him. And then it started with WhatsApp. What's, what's, what's? Are you sad that she's going to a different state? Of course. Do you want to marry her? Would that be possible? Here, anything is possible. Everyone is equal. Can you read my future? Sure, you'll see. Drink up your coffee first. Will you always love her? For all eternity? Really? Yes, really. <laughs> As his father, I welcome the idea. I would be happy for him. She's a good person. Take a look. Something will happen. There might be problems. I'm ready for them. Do you see it? Take a look. But how does it end? The end looks all white. I don't know, only God knows. But I see good signs. I see Friedland, land of peace, as a metaphor, and not just because of the name. It has a message that we have to be a land of peace, one that takes in people fleeing very different, perilous situations and treats them humanely. I think Friedland has a very important function to make Germans realize you were at war once too and you were taken in. And I think this is the big lesson that anyone, from one moment to the next, can lose even the ground beneath their feet. And there is no greater harm one can inflict on humanity than to close the door on people.